Good afternoon. It's a pleasure not to speak to you virtually, but to see you in person. I welcome also everyone virtually, of course, but it's been such a long time that we were able to travel to workshops and I truly enjoy it. Yeah? So I'm happy to be here. Um, and uh, I will talk about uh, this. By the way, I just found this out that my title is When Casualty Meets Interference. Yeah? So what it was automatic correction. What it's supposed to be is causality, but I really like casualty <laughs> also. <laughs> so when causality meets uh, uh, inference, complexity in neuroscience. We are here in this session on uh, brain states and complexity. And I will actually talk to you about modeling and understanding brain states, evolution of brain states. And uh, the key example along which I wish to do this is epilepsy, so a pathological brain state. And uh, the angle I wish to take is actually one of the objectives, one of the missions we have in the Human Brain Project, that is understanding the brain through a, a personalized brain modeling approach. In particular, in the work package one, we are dealing with that. Yeah? And there are a few aspects that are very important. Understanding, so it's not just building a brain model, but uh, formulating a form of a mechanistic hypothesis as a causal hypothesis. And in our hands, typically, it is a mathematical model. And this can then be confronted with the data. And I'm not just talking about data fitting, and you will see actually the direction in which I want to take it. Yeah? Data fitting, optimization, these are viable approaches, but we can do significantly more. In particular, very often we have to know, are there competing uh, mechanisms, confounding mechanisms that you can dis uh, disentangle? How often are we wrong? How can I know that we are actually wrong? Yeah? And, uh, 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 inference is biasing these different elements that are not optional but obligatory when you're dealing with model and data. Essentially, as a neuroscientist, you want to understand the underlying uh, mechanisms and uh, hence you fall naturally into, uh, on, onto this path. And the entry point I wish to take is the level of modeling that we have developed over the past um, 15 years by now, together with uh, several colleagues and friends, Randy McIntosh, Petra Ritter, uh, Alain Destex also. Uh, so uh, there is quite a large group of people that has contributed to this over the many years. And I wish to highlight it first to give you a perspective to show you what the fr uh, mindset is, the framework from which I w uh, wish to address the issue of uh, causal mechanisms, actually, and how to infer them. So in the virtual brain, which is a neuroinformatics platform, an open source neuroinformatics platform that has become uh, one of the principal simulators within the eBrains platform on, for large scale brain networks. There, we are using a fusion approach where we are actually taking data of uh, individual subjects and um, um, organize them in the same brain reference space. What shall I do? Shall I use a laser pointer or shall I use a mouse? So the, there is no mouse cursor. Then I use a laser pointer. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Yeah. So we are collecting data from individuals. We are extracting them and we are organizing them uh, in a co-registered fashion in the same reference space. And we are unfolding them actually in three-dimensional physical space. To arrive at a network, we are actually parcelating topographical information that is available to us, typically from MRI. And from uh, diffusion tensor-weighted imaging, we can actually extract topological information. This provides us with the connectivity, the connectome. Cross-registered, and spanned in the same space, we have a non-functional avatar. Yeah? This avatar uh, has network nodes and connectivity, and it needs to be actually rendered functional. And this, the way to do this is that you're actually equipping it with mathematical models. Mathematical models are, can computationally, autonomously generate time series. Yeah? And then through the connectivity, actually, communication between individual brain areas is possible. 
The type of modeling that we use is mean field modeling. Alain will speak about this more. But essentially what it is, is you take a microscopic approach, you model each individual neuron, you uh, apply some uh, techniques from statistics, um, typically a certain type of averaging techniques and the flavor is determined by the assumption about uh, the statistical correlations that are behind that. But it allows you to extract some collective uh, variables. Yeah? Collective variables in this context are variables that compress some of the information that is relevant to describe the macroscopic organization of activity thereof. Yeah? Typically, we collect the neurons then in uh, inhibitory and excitatory neurons and uh, derive ver low dimensional equations that allow us then to perform this type of simulations. Here, this is from Alain's lab. Uh, you see a raster plot. Uh, each individual spike is representing an action potential, excitatory dynamics, inhibitory dynamics evolving over time. You can average it. Then you have the inhibitory dynamics here, excitatory. And you can actually autonomously also uh, simulate the mean field equations and actually you can mimic certain properties, statistical properties of the dynamics you have here and plot it over time. You can then change some of the parameters that have been compressed in these uh, reduced parameters and actually vary them, parameterize uh, uh, them in the parameter space and change the uh, sp uh, states. Go from an asynchronous state, which is a more normal regular functioning state, to slow oscillations that we encounter uh, in sleep and in other areas in order to render it also into paroxysmal uh, oscillations which are characteristic for epileptic discharges as high frequencies. So there is a lot of activity ongoing on this. We will hear more about this later. When we equip every single network node with an equation like this, then we have the uh, we rendered the initially geometric form that we have built out of the neuroimaging data active in the sense that we have a, different, a set of differential equations where psi is a state variable at the location x. This here is a mean field dynamics at the same location, so it determines the individual dynamics here. And then you have nearest neighbor interactions via a, a short range connectivity function and the connectome, the large scale projections from one area to the other. And you see also that uh, this is undergoing a time delay because the distances can be up to 200 uh, 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 millimeters or 20 centimeters, the longest fibers that are crossing the colossal uh, uh, tracks. So this uh, model itself can actually now be further extended um, uh, uh, as follows. Yeah? We are on the source level. Through the topography, we were able to put the individual nodes there. And then we connected the individual nodes through the individual connectome. So this is where some of the personalized information is coming in. And what we can then can do in addition to this, we can actually add in the sensors, the way we use it in applications. This here is EEG, stereotactic EEG. So in epilepsy, we're working with invasive recordings. Uh, and uh, it's stereotactic because we are entering into the volume. But we can also project from the individual sources up to the MEG or EG detectors, or use a balloon wind castle model to compute the hemodynamic uh, uh, activity corresponding to the source activity that we have here. So this is something in terms of applications, something extremely important because this step, the more precise you are able to handle that, the more precise you can actually infor, uh, infer the underlying mechanisms, not just where the sources are, but actually start disentangling the time series of the individual sources, which you need to know in order to build the physiological models. Yeah? So. This is a background. Now we take these models and actually take it to the next level. The, what I just presented you, the principal concepts have been presented approximately 2012. The virtual brain platform was released. The mean field models have been improved. So we are around 2015. In the last three, four years in the human brain project, we were actually able to go uh, some steps beyond that. One aspect that increases enormously the predictive capacity is 
high resolution. This is very important. Second one, it's actually, uh, uh, today we can go to a factor 1000 higher resolution and that improves the predictive power significantly. The other element uh, that plays a very important uh, role is personalization, that we actually improve the methods that allow us to adapt the parameters we have in these models and render them, number one, patient-specific, because you want to make patient-specific statements if you're talking about pathological uh, states, number one. And number two, you want to be able to evaluate or diagnostic, or make a diagnostics about how valid your statements are and how confident you are about uh, the statements you're going to make for the individual patients because there uh, are typically consequences in the hand of a, clini a treating clinician. Yeah? So in terms of resolution, we can go, actually the resolution that I have shown you uh, in the uh, classic virtual brain models as I introduced it, there we are approximately the here you see it also, the uh, parcellation that you see here, these large areas, they are between 10 to 20 square centimeters. And this was collapsed into one network node. Yeah? Um, now we are able to go with uh, the activities uh, in terms of brain atlases we have in the Human Brain Project, higher up to a factor 1,000, uh, at least when we are using it. In the big brain that provides us with an atlas, actually, that uh, the, with a brain atlas in which we are able to represent the high resolution data. And something that is very important is that we are actually having the atlas represented at a sufficiently high resolution in three dimensional space. We are losing the personalized aspect there, naturally, because these are ex vivo data. So, the other element that is important is in vivo has individual predictive power, ex vivo provides us with high resolution. We need to merge these two streams together in order to actually improve our predictive power. And I, I will show you as I go along how we do that. Yeah? But now within the brain atlas, what we are able to actually, we are uh, um, having data that have been heterogeneously collected in different modalities that allow us actually to, knowledge was one of the words that you had on the screen, yeah? The knowledge that we gathered across hundreds of laboratories, represent them in the same space. And actually by mapping it using some spatial nonlinear uh, transformations, mapping it into the same space in which the data can be appropriately uh, interpreted. This is relevant because otherwise the data are not comparable with each other. What you see here, this is Roxana uh, Koymans. She's working with one of these post-mortem brains that travels actually between different laboratories, between Paris, Amsterdam, and uh, Jülich. This box has been specially designed in order to undergo different uh, imaging uh, techniques. Here you, some, uh, you see some uh, stains, some uh, immunostaining uh, that has been performed that allows us to buy some of the receptors. And here, uh, this is a PLI plot from Markus Axe and Jülich, polarized light imaging that provides us actually with resolution on the micrometer level. Yeah? So there we are almost at cellular resolution. What we are using, so in our hands, is uh, the following. We are uh, using the resolution coming from a free surfer with high resolution scans that allows us to provide a, a resolution of about one square millimeter but we can actually link it to connectivity coming from a Cyril Poupon's lab providing us with resolution in the sub millimeter range. We are merging these elements together and, uh, and provide in the brain reference space that we have developed. Uh, which allows us actually to perform simulations on the millimeter scale. And this is currently the resolution that we are working with. And technically speaking, we don't want to go beyond that because at some point the mean field approximation that I was talking about earlier actually breaks down and it will be difficult to justify. There is one exception 
unless you perform core simulation. Yeah, and uh, we I will not talk about this, but I think uh, Michele Migliore, who will come later, he will probably speak about this. Here you see data from. Uh, Kathy Chavon's lab, where you have on the one hand side activity propagation uh, in a so-called ECOG, electrocorticogram, yeah? but there where the red cross is, you can actually go in detail and you see a microarray, you see a detailed organization of spiral wave uh, structure on the uh, millimeter, submillimeter scale. Just for proof of concept that we actually need this type of uh, uh, representation in order to capture this type of details, independent of the just improved source to sensor mapping. This is what we can do now. Yeah, so this is a, a specific example. This is rhinal cortex. The fibers emanating from the rhinal cortex in the same hemisphere, projecting onto the other hemisphere. And you can actually quantify the connectivity here, just as an example, vertex connectivity strength of the fibers coming from the rhinal cortex. What we can do is the parameters under our control, we can actually increase the degree of epileptogenicity. In our hands, it's hyper excitability in the type of mean field models that we work with, and actually then run this type of simulation. Please note this point. Did you see it? It came up heterogeneously. It did not propagate through the surface. You will see it uh, 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 in the next run. But then it started taking over the activity and uh, reorganizes itself running these propagating waves. Yeah, watch at this point here. Yeah? This is the mix between homogeneous fibers, intracortical, and heterogeneous fibers. This, can, this is obligatory uh, for a system that you want to describe with high uh, resolution. Yeah? So you need these two elements in there. Something that we always see and that you also saw on the precedent slide is this propagating circular wave activity within the areas that are epileptogenic. And there are some hypotheses have been made that this is actually linked to the seizure stop of propagation. Yeah? We can go further. And uh, one area that is of extreme importance, for instance, is uh, the hippocampal field. And here you see the corona monis, uh, the CA regions that are folded into each other, we can actually unfold them. Into the hippocampus, you have the cortical areas that then go into the hippocampus. Before that, it was an isolated area, but we can actually now build this uh, field continuously across the different areas and perform some simulated high resolution propagation patterns as we see it uh, in uh, uh, the experiment. When I speak about co-simulation, sometimes there are regions of interest. Yeah? So for instance, in collaboration with Michele Migliore, where we are replacing one of these regions by nest simulations with 40 million individual neurons just for one region of uh, interest, and the rest we do, uh, in fact, with uh, mean field simulations. Yeah? So now it can be placed within the virtual brain context um, in the 3D, and uh, projected on the individual electrodes that are implanted specifically for this particular patient. Here, in this case, so these are simulated data as measured in the SEG. This is as the patient that we have modeled and estimated his, his, yeah, his parameters, in fact, yeah, uh, uh, that then allows us actually to mimic the type of seizure patterns that we also observe in the individual uh, data. But for this, we need actually the type of methodology in order to estimate the parameters, which requires a causal hypothesis, as I addressed earlier. But wh why I'm pointing this out here is this is now an application where we can use it as an in silico platform to model and simulate autonomously individual seizures. Another means of using this personalized brain model at the higher resolution is actually to use it as a template for fitting. And there we are even closer to the clinics. Yeah? The individualized in silico platform for simulation is relevant, where you can actually ask different clinical hypotheses and implement them, for instance, th of therapeutic nature. But it's being preceded by identifying where the epileptogenic uh, zone is and how it's organized. And this is the workflow that we're actually using. This is what I just described to you. Individual brain imaging data, organize it in the same reference space, equip it with mathematical models, 
and then get as much individual data as possible because you want to bias these parameters here, um, including the individual uh, connectivity because here we are, we are dealing with high resolution data, but f uh, sometimes there are lesions in the data. If the MRI is so-called MRI positive, if we can detect that, we can bias the parameters in uh, the model and we can actually uh, use it in a Bayesian inference framework as a so-called prior yeah, in the estimation. And this is what we do. We are using a Bayesian framework where we have prior knowledge biasing the parameters and then estimating using so-called Monte Carlo procedures the parameter in the model and as an output we get a parameter distribution that we can actually uh, pass on to the clinician um, uh, pass on to the clinician as an a usable element that is patient specific in the clinical decision making. I want to enter in a few more details, in fact, because they are relevant and after all this is an educational workshop, right? Uh, uh, it's not just data fitting, it's not just parameter optimization. You need to uh, have an, a more sophisticated approach in order to interrogate actually this patient's brain, there is a multitude of uh, possibilities how the parameters may represent the reality of the mechanisms in there. Yeah? So typically, so this is what you can measure. This is pre spikes, and then seizure onset. It goes very fast, zzz, so you see the thickness of the line, uh, and then it slows down in seizure offset. This seizure is represented here. Yeah? So pre spikes, it's the same seizure. Yeah? And then uh, this is a frequency time. It goes, uh, so f uh, high frequency discharges and then slowing down until the seizure offset. But there is a large range of seizures. How can we actually, what do we want to extract? What, we, uh, what do we want to have actually mapped upon the data? What we do very frequently is we look at the seizure envelope, uh, what you see here. So we're not looking at the individual uh, fast uh, discharges, but actually at the envelope function. And there is a large variety also within the individual uh, uh, um, patient. Actually, every seizure within pre phase, onset, discharge, offset, post phase can be represented mathematically, actually uh, by a spiral object that uh, has this form here. There are m quite a number of papers on this that have uh, shown this and systematically classified that because depending on how you go from uh, the pre ictal state to the ictal state, it goes typically through a bifurcation. You can actually classify these seizures. It, a spiral, this is a resting state of uh, this is seizure onset. You go into the discharges and offset and back into the resting state. When you compute the envelope function that you have here, you actually project it into this ground here, this resting state, and this is the fast discharges. Yeah? We can take this actually as our data features and start actually confronting this with a sampling approaches, so so-called Monte Carlo sampling approaches, which are trying to estimate the parameters for millions and millions of different realizations. I projected this in the ground. For a seizure, it gives you this circular structure. Here I'm plotting excitability. Here you see the circular structure. But if I reduce excitability, then you're staying only on the resting state. Yeah? So you have actually this type of behavior. And this is finally the space that we are sampling. Parameter, discharges, discharge patterns, or in terms of uh, seizure envelope, times the number of brain regions. So it provides us with a uh, approximately 1,000 dimensional uh, parameter space, which is sampleable, if this is a word. Yeah? But, so, and this is what it looks like. These are experimental data. These are different nodes. These are the corresponding time series. And when you project the uh, experimental data into this uh, dimension down there, you see here for this node, there was clearly a seizure pattern. Here, look at the, the uh, values. This one is very narrow, so it's essentially hanging out here. Yeah? So this one never discharged. So we can actually sample the variability, the behavior, the variability in behavior, the variability in mechanisms. Yeah? And this essentially then translates along this, sorry, along this axis here, 
we want to get a parameter distribution for the likelihood that an area is epileptogenic or not. And this provides us then with um, outputs that look like this. Often they are multimodal, these are experimental data. This area here would be excitable, but taking everything together, connectome, the data we have sampled on the sensor level, each sensor has a particular implantation, so mapping from sensor to sources, that, uh, how the seizure propagated. It can be equally explained via actually a healthy uh, excitability area versus a uh, epileptogenic area. But don't forget, it's not just one area. There are actually many areas, multiple hundreds. Actually, this one I can represent here and here and we are having this particular landscape. And this is a reality every one of you as a neuroscientist has to confront. We call this neurodegeneracy on one hand side or non-identifiability given the data we have. And more data will not necessarily help with that. If you perform an optimization procedure, you're always locally somewhere here, if you're lucky. If you're performing a variational inference approach as we do it in DCM where you make a Gaussian approximation, you're actually taking this red distribution here. There you're actually in a multi-modality, you're even completely off because you're actually between the two maxima. But this is a reality we deal with and that needs to be sampled. Yeah? This can be done only with this type of approaches. And that is being translated into a brain plot, a heat map of excitability for the own patient, in this case overlaid of a, a post-surgical MRI. This because there is actually a reality for this po patient because the execution that follows is actually a resection of the brain area that is epileptogenic. This is being tested now in a real world scenario in a clinical trial. Uh, we are running this in France, 13 reference centers. Data being collected the way I described to you, centralized in Lyon, anonymized, sent to Marseille, virtualized, analyzed, inferred, expressed in terms of a, a clinical report and sent back to the individual centers for decision making. Results look like this for individual patients. Overlay, post-surgical here for a case that worked quite well. And here for a case that did not work well in the sense that the, post, uh, the surgery that has been performed was not consistent with what uh, the virtual epileptic patient, this, uh, the name of the procedure, VP, has actually uh, predicted. Yeah? So uh, we can use this type of overlap, good overlap or not uh, a good overlap, as a predictor, actually, and for evaluation, for statistical evaluation. That's what we are doing. This is the inclusion of the patients that we have. We are not allowed to interfere, of course, with prospective patients with a uh, clinical trial. We would contaminate this, but we can look retrospectively at the situation where we are, which has actually justified the clinical trial for 12 seizure-free patients, VP. The uh, correspondence was actually very good in terms of precision. For the non-seizure-free patients, actually it drops down below the actual surgery uh, that has been performed and uh, uh, it correlates actually with seizure freedom and non-seizure freedom. So the results for the prospective patients we should actually know in a few um, months, hope, no, 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 uh, by the end of the next year. There were delays, sorry. It was due but there was a delay by one year. I have prepared a use case for illustration, which I'm skipping here for sake of time. We can actually go in much detail for individual patients and actually make predictions uh, and tailor the analysis for the patient in detail. Yeah? I will just summarize what I wanted to show you is essentially what we can do with eBrains. As a scientist, you want to ask questions about knowledge and understanding. This means you're asking question about causality, about underlying mechanisms. In eBrains, we typically formulate this mathematically and want to confront it with the data. For this, you have to do this type of one way or another, this sampling that I just showed you. Are. But your questions are typically formulated up here on this level. Yeah? There is something under the hood 
that is the technical level that uh, is linked to uh, uh, sa safety, protection of data, high, uh, performance computation, simulation, etc. But very often you're actually not interested in this. Yeah? As a scientist, you want to ask questions on this level and feed the data in here. This is what eBrains can actually offer. And all I did here today is showed you a workflow that is implemented and available here in eBrains, essentially starting from the SEG data and high resolution anatomical data, performing inference and then making predictions. But this workflow can actually be executed as is, uh, just as an example uh, in eBrains today. And that's what I wanted to share with you as a use case. I'm stopping here. I'm thanking my colleagues and friends in e uh, in eBrains, my clinical colleagues that have made this possible, and of course, the funders. Thank you very much.